Okay, let's. We're now uh, going to focus on a huge country that probably doesn't get as much coverage as it should um, in Asia. So we're delighted to have three veterans of the Indian business jet market. Um, Atish, do you want to just start by um, explaining how long you've been involved in business aviation in India for? Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Morning, everyone. Uh, I've been involved in business aviation for almost 18 years in India and uh, worked with uh, most of the corporate aviation departments, uh, set up the first FBO in India, in Mumbai, and uh, very recently uh, set up aircraft management for ExecuJet in India. And now you're... And now I have uh, started my own aviation consultancy firm, and uh, I look after aircraft sales for Bootsan Aviation in India and Southeast Asia. Vinit, how long have you been plugging away in India? Well, I'm a little bit of a newbie. I've been around only for 10 years. Uh, uh, I started out with a telecom business, and I moved over to aviation, uh, thinking it'll be more fun to play with planes instead of antennas. And uh, so it's been 10 years now. I've been through uh, owning a couple of planes, selling them, operating them, and now I'm uh, trying to sell and manage them. And this year, you, introduced, you, you announced a joint venture with ACAS. That's right, that's right. So uh, uh, I started a company called Invision Air, uh, which is an operator in India. And when we moved into aircraft sales and management, we realized that we needed to partner with uh, somebody on a global scale, because aircraft sales just within India is very limited. Uh, this is when we connected with uh, Andre or ACAS and started ACAS India now. So we have, uh, uh, we're launching the management program and uh, continuing the sales process in India through ACAS. Nilesh, how long have you been? Well, selling in there. So I've been working for Bombardier for 22 years and selling aircraft in India since 2005 and Asia since 2012. So 2005, there was a huge amount of excitement in India about aviation opening up and there were lots of people getting very excited that it was going to be a huge business jet market. What went wrong? Oh, that was huge. I mean, when I first landed there, I just went there with my backpack and we started selling planes, you know. And we put a lot of uh, metal in the country. And if you see, Bombardier has about 40% market share. But a lot of those transactions happened between, I would say, 2006 and 10, and what I call uh, Pill Lehman, <laughs> the, the key point. I think a couple of things uh, that happened. Uh, number one, I think uh, there was some political issues in terms of the government and the crackdown. Same, same kind of issues that we see in China in terms of in a visibility, um, negative visibility if you own an aircraft, right? Uh, the other aspect I think we all face in India is uh, the challenge of the customs duty, right? I mean, so nobody, it doesn't matter whether you're a corporate or a private individual, wants to pay up to 35% duty, right? means in some European countries, that structure is there, but there's very good uh, way to ex escape the VAT, you know, with the right kind of uh, structures. But in India, it's very difficult, right? So some customers did try to do the NSOP angle, to, uh, which is basically the Indian equivalent of uh, a charter license, an AOC, right? Uh, unfortunately, even with that, the tax man came after them, right? So it was... It was extremely prohibitive from a customs duty perspective, right? So that didn't help. And I think after that, there was a little bit of economic uncertainty. Today, the market looks great. I think we've, we have a big believer in India. Um, you know, we see the, the fleet doubling over the next nine years, so which is a big item, right? So it's about 140 aircrafts in India. There were 10 additions last year, split between pre-owned and new, which is a good sign. The activity is yeah. big. But there were some uh, reductions as well. So I think the net effect is still about one or two aircraft uh, last year. Yeah. The, um, Vinit, we've touched on the NSOP or the non-scheduled operator's permit, um, which in some ways also held back the market, didn't it? Because it encouraged every corporate to set up their own 
Yes, exactly. It sort of was a way, a channel that everybody thought they would use to save uh, on taxes. And, uh, you know, when everybody jumps a bandwagon, obviously what happens is somebody gets look, to look at it in more detail, and then it kind of fell apart. So uh, it was a channel that was opened up, uh, but unfortunately it didn't really work. Uh, but now there are, uh, there are methods in which you can use in order to uh, uh, sort of intelligently get, uh, make use of that, that channel. But it, 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 it encouraged um, lots of flight departments, lots of owners to have their own. Do you think, you know, which has always made it very hard for operators to crack that market, or third-party operators, which also makes it harder to get financing. Do you, you know, do you see that changing now? Yeah, in the last few years, I have seen that the single-fly aircraft corporate departments, which were mainly formed uh, to evade the duty, I would say, if it appears to be that way, uh, have now started, consol the market is now consolidating. And uh, these uh, single aircraft owners have now put their aircraft for sale. And uh, you see more of uh, real-time uh, aircraft management companies coming up. There are new companies like Empire, Tit Titan Aviation, and so on. They're just de developing an ACAS, as I'm sure my colleague here sitting here. So new companies have, have, uh, have started coming up. So you see the market is undergoing a consolidation phase right now. But you know, what we're really seeing is that there's a certain fundamental cultural uh, concept in India of owning your own plane and then having your own people look after it. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing right now to you know, allow them to let go of, of an asset like that. And uh, I see that uh, in my experience in the last 10 years that the older generation is the one that kind of holds it back and the younger generation is a lot more open to outsourcing as a concept. So I think that down the line, we can see more chances of this, this working out. So, the, so we've, that's sort of held back the market, the tax and, and also high profile, um, uh, how do I describe it? High profile uh, repossessions or, or, or seizing of assets. The other thing is that you know, the, the, the three big airports of, you know, how easy is it actually to fly into Delhi or Mumbai? No, infrastructure is a big challenge. I mean, you know, right now Mumbai and Delhi are, are a nightmare. Uh, with Mumbai, parking is almost impossible. Uh, you can't get a parking spot at all. You have to have 24 to 48 hours within which you've got to move it out. Otherwise, the fines are, are ridiculous. Uh, so right now, if somebody's going to buy a plane, uh, you have to park somewhere else. So there's no chance of Mumbai. Delhi is a little better, I think. Uh, and there is a major slot issue in Mumbai where you have three curfews, uh, morning 8 to 10, 5.30 to 7.30, again in the night. So it further restricts your, uh, your flight movements. I think the infrastructure challenge, especially in big hubs like Mumbai and Delhi, are one biggest barriers. The other is resources, right? There's, means as the market grew, there was lack of skilled professionals in terms of pilots and engineers and the airlines. And when at that point, the airlines were also growing at the same, or much faster pace, right? So there was this dogfight for resources, the the taxes, and I think again, it's like we discussed yesterday. Australia is a much more mature market with the infrastructure and airports and everything else to support. I think that there is a, the fundamental need and drive in, for business aviation in India exists. I think it's, uh, the generation shift uh, is happening. I think even the DGCA is starting to understand it doesn't help having a, uh, 200 NSOP operators, right? So it, you know, that yeah, means- we have, about, we have about 80, 80 to 90 NSOP operators and we have 140 planes. So you can imagine it's ridiculous to have so many operators to be managed. And the DGC is also very commercial uh, aviation oriented. They still haven't got that business aviation philosophy in yet. And, and that's the other issue. The commercial aviation is growing at a crazy pace right now. It's the fastest growing uh, industry right now commercially in the world. I think it's at 17%. China's at 13%. So, so there are some benefits that we're going to get with that uh, in the sense that this, the airports are being developed. There are a lot of small airports that are being, you know, going to have access. But at the same time, our pilots are being taken away from us. Uh, engineers are being taken away. And uh, it's very difficult to keep, the, keep the, the, the human resources angle in control. But fundamentally, it's a subcontinent where you have companies need to fly around. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the size of India and, the, you know, we have 400 airports. Uh, you know, someone just said the other day that China is going to have 500 airports soon. 
but we already have 400 airports, 200 of which right now small jets like the, the Phenoms, et cetera, can fly to. So, and the other ones are now just going to be developed as the, the, the regional aviation develops. So we do have a very basic level of infrastructure. The second layer, which is the necessity to the logistics, the, all the other aspects, now need to be developed. And commercial aviation growth will help that. Okay, we've got some questions from the audience. So here's a nice one, so in, which is just coming up, I think. So what are the main challenges for operators? What's your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is the infrastructure and the regulatory issues. As Nilesh has already uh, mentioned, um, airports where actually the wealth concentration is, uh, I see most of my customers coming out of Mumbai where there is hardly any parking space. So once the second airport comes into play, you know, then it will be a game changer and you will see more aircrafts being added very soon. So infrastructure and regulations are the two main issues. When, when's the new airport opening? I think another nine years from now. <laughs> it's a long way. <laughs> it's a very long way, and uh, these projects do get delayed at times. Um, to be fair, the, you know, the UK is no better. Um, one of the questions I think I'm guessing is from a financier. Um, how easy or hard is it to deregister an aircraft and get it out of India? So it's become a lot better now. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've done a significant number of s transactions over the last couple of years, and uh, we've done some deregistrations within even, you know, five days, six days. So uh, you do have to prepare a little bit before the deregistration process, but uh, now uh, it's a lot better than it was five, six years ago. When, when we talk about the startup airlines that have grown fast, of course, one was a uh, Kingfisher. Um, you know, which was a great airline to fly on and great beer. I know, they, they washed your glasses and all. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how far did that set back aircraft finance in India? Because I know it was signed pre-Cape Town, and I know it, but it, it's, it's, there is still an ACJ parked at Mumbai Airport, isn't there, with birds living in the wings? Yeah, I think it was just so... I, I will answer this one for you. Uh, although the Kingfisher incident did um, cause a lot of um, concern for the aircraft financiers and lessors, but, uh, but mainly, f mainly uh, with the new uh, regional connectivity scheme which the government has launched, the government invited uh, most of the aircraft leasing companies for a meeting in which they expressed their uh, concern about uh, the, uh, the ease of deregistration, deregistration of the aircraft during such events. And uh, now government has made it, uh, especially for the regional airlines and the commercial airlines, uh, they allow the aircrafts to fly on a foreign registration so that it can be, you know, uh, the lease can be cancelled in case the, uh, the airline company is not able to. But that's not available yet for business jets? Uh, not yet. And then you'd have a cabotage issue if you have a foreign aircraft? So traditionally what happens is the rules are generally made for commercial aviation. Now it is made for regional airlines and very soon, uh, maybe soon means at least three to five years from now, it will you know, be made for I, I, I think, aviation. like we said earlier, DGCA requires um, a change of um, thought in terms of understanding business aviation. And that's been a challenge uh, in India, equating business aviation to economic growth and um, economic activity, right? Like we mentioned yesterday. Every time a business jet is parked somewhere, jobs are being created, right? If, especially when we're trying to, in India, encourage regional growth in remote areas, if somebody's setting up a steel plant or setting up a, a factory and investing a billion dollars in an area that's inaccessible, they will need aircraft, right? Our customers in India buy the Bombardier Challenger or Learjets and even the Globals to go access some of these remote areas which is hardly accessible. And we have a few examples where customers built the airports, used the business jets, and now there are regional hubs in that region. So we kind of encourage that regional connectivity, which is what the government is looking for. So I think the DGCA has to learn the value of business aviation and has to uh, adapt to the regulatory framework to support us. Right? Has the 
atmosphere changed? Because Prime Minister Modi is quite a common user of business jets. Well, he is a common user, and I think he probably is where he is because of business jets. I, and and I'm, not, I'm serious about that because he's flying every day on them. But the minute he changed over, <laughs> everything changed. So, uh, you know, once he stopped flying, uh, he's a very populous uh, prime minister. His masses are the more important priority. So uh, the business aviation didn't really get the, the, the uh, required attention. So therefore, the regional connectivity and all these other areas are what are being focused on uh, in order for the masses to appeal. But there is still a mentality in the government that business aviation is not still a tool, it is still a toy, and uh, that's, a, that's an old thing that I think everyone in the, every country has to fight with, and we're continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. well, I think uh, what Mrs. Modi has done is the growth in economy, right? India is growing uh, between 6 to 7 percent every year, so the, the and everywhere there's economic growth, there is business aircraft demand. So that, that's why we see a lot of activity in terms of potential transactions that we are all completing, new and pre-owned. Um, but I think we still have to go overcome the hurdles in terms of financing, in terms of DGCA regulations, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of recruitment and retention. I think the economy has grown, but we have to also keep in mind the currency. Uh, you know, the Indian rupee was at uh, 40, uh, what, 39, 40 when I started the business. Today it's 67. So that's a, that's a you know, significant difference uh, in the last 10 years, while the Chinese uh, RMB is actually you know, appreciated. So you can imagine the purchasing power of the Indian customers is, is reducing by 10% every year. Uh, and now again, after today's Fed's hike, et cetera, we're talking about another uh, six months of probably uh, increased debt dollar strength. So that's a, that's a factor when you're buying a $40, $50 million jet. When the currency is a factor, it's also for financing, it's a factor. So you know, that's, that's another area. You've brought up the currency. Someone no. in the audience. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Does the Reserve Bank of India make uh, foreign exchange borrowing difficult for no. buyers in India? No, I don't think. I mean, there's regulatory framework to comply with, but it's not difficult. Most of our aircrafts that we sell into India are financed, and they are primarily financed by uh, offshore banks in the U.S. dollar financing. We encourage our customers to take U.S. dollar financing because it's much more appealing to them. As long as you follow the regulatory framework, I think there's no problem. Yeah, I think it's just a time uh, issue sometimes with the Reserve Bank to get some of the approvals, but it is now much, much better. So you can, you can use foreign, foreign loans. Okay. How can... It's always the job of the OEMs. How can OEMs become more vocal in India and trying to influence the change? Would you welcome OEMs getting more vocal? Most definitely. I mean, I think that's where we need even more help. And we have an association called the Business Aviation Operators Association, and I think that needs to get more strength. Uh, more OEMs need to come in uh, into that and use that uh, as a way of <laughs> pushing, pushing the industry agenda ahead. Uh, and if not BAOA, even directly. I mean, you know, one, one is to go through a... Uh, but even directly making, uh, making claims, uh, making their positions clear with the government will help a lot. Yeah, I guess we need more lobbying to be done here. But um, uh, it has done some progress. Our Business Aircraft Operator Association has managed to uh, do uh, quite some progress. There have been changes. Uh, one of the recent changes I would like to highlight is, um, is going to be um, is that for foreign registered aircrafts, the permit requirement which was earlier seven days was reduced to three days. And from three days, it is going to be very soon reduced to one day. So that is encouraging more uh, foreign operators to operate at short notice into India. I think I mean, being the pioneer into India as Bombardier, I think we obviously care about the market significantly. We always played an active role in lobbying uh, for this. And uh, I, I firmly believe not only just the OEMs, OEMs, operators, everybody in the industry, we all have a, a vested interest in growing the industry. And I think we all believe that's tremendous potential. It's an education process. Unfortunately, when you deal with government and the people you educate, they change too, right? So the person in DGCA charged today retires tomorrow. And that's, a, you know, you, then it's a groundhog day trying to educate. So I think one of the things I've always advocated is that industry coming together to, to take the best practices that exist in Europe, FAA, YASA, and provide some kind of a white paper to DGCA as to how to encourage and stimulate business aircraft growth from that DG, DGCA perspective. The second part of that equation is 
the custom duty, right? Which is, <laughs> which is something we all find is, whatever way we say it, is still prohibitive. And there's no easy way out of it because the the finance minister who put it put it with uh, <laughs> a very specific goal of looking optics wise is very hard to take it out. So that's something that we need to overcome. The infrastructure and the resource challenge will be a more long term challenge. Right? India is a, a country that requires a lot of uh, grunt work. It takes time, and everything takes time. But it does move forward, right? The so infrastructure will come in place, and the recruitment uh, will continue to be a challenge until the resource pool is strong enough. Do we have any questions from the audience? OK, so there's a nice one. Um, before we go on to that one, let's go for, let's just talk about the fleet quickly. It's another question. So what types of aircraft are popular? And right. say you can't say Bombardier. <laughs> No, no, I, I, <laughs> we hold 40% of the market share, so that says it all. But uh, I think it's mostly the large uh, cabin, so, you know, the Challenger or the Global or equivalent categories. But recently we've seen quite a bit of activity in the Learjet side too. So. Yeah, I think, I think for a little while it's still going to be the large cabin that's going to dominate it because of the uh, clients going abroad a lot. But as the, the local infrastructure and things develop, we see the mid-size as well coming in. So I would say that for the next two to three years, uh, probably the large cabin, and beyond that, we start looking at the mid-size uh, coming in for local flying. Atish, you personally have got a lot of excitement about Air Medical as well, haven't you? Medivac. Yeah, I, I agree um, that yeah, Air Medical is uh, another very uh, um, good opportunity developing in India. There are hardly any professional uh, air ambulances, uh, dedicated air ambulances in India. And uh, I strongly feel there is a very good potential for it. Uh, presently, there are a couple of players who are evaluating the, uh, the right business model to get into the market. So yes, India has got good potential. And definitely, the helicopter market is another big one for us. I think Vinit was a pioneer when he started InnoVision, Innovision um, a, a few years back. Uh, maybe the market wasn't ready then, but I think that is tremendous potential for a proper charter operator based in India to grow that, you know, concept buyer into uh, in a business aviation. Because yeah. there is there is a, the, the the cultural mentality to travel in business aviation exists, right? Because there's there's quite a lot of uh, not only billionaires but multimillionaires who would prefer to travel in business aircraft. Just the convenience and ease of use is not there, right? If somebody created a structure and a model in India using, you know, products like Learjet and Challengers to just uh, connect within India and within the region, I think there's a tremendous potential to grow that market. Yeah, I think branded charter, which we started out 10 years ago, was a little too early. Uh, but probably now is a more uh, realistic time, and, and I see that VistaJet is coming in. Um, one of the things you have to really be concerned about when you're coming into India is to be ensured that your service level is maintained. And I think uh, last yesterday we were talking to a lot of the management companies looking into coming into India. Uh, I, I think one of the, the, the hurdles uh, that you need to uh, sort of overcome is make sure that your brand doesn't get impacted when you launch something in India. Uh, because you know, right now, logistics and, and, and uh, you know, all the other issues are quite high. And you must make sure that your operational efficiency is really good so that you can give the client what you promise him. Uh, give him at least similar service as you do globally. And that's probably the reason why many of these brands haven't come into India so far. And I believe now, as India develops further, more of these brands will come in, which I think is welcome because more people talking about it, more people uh, you know, talking about aircraft management uh, will help the, help the industry grow. Ten years back when I approached some of the big players to come into India, whether it's TAG or ExecuJet and others, their priority was China, right? And rightly so, because they saw a tremendous amount of growth. Now most of the people have their s bases in China, um, or at least... Uh, or, or on their second joint venture. <laughs> so I think where I think in India there is bureaucratic logistical infrastructure challenges, but most companies can go in there by themselves. So I think that you will see that you know, as as the market grows, um, some of the international players are going to set up operations in India. Uh, VistaJet is a good example, which has entered last year in the Indian market. 
and they plan to expand more. So, okay, two quick fire questions. Does India have the same issues um, with the rest of Asia in terms of pilots? Yes, this is a yes. major. Yes. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nilesh. Yes, of course, experienced pilot. And that's a dearth of them um, in India as well as the rest of Asia because of the growing uh, commercial aircraft industry. Yeah, we also have a process for getting pilots inducted into India, which is not easy. Uh, you have to have a certain number of hours of flying. You have to have a certain training. So that also creates a hurdle. So you have to four or five months before a pilot can actually come in and fly into India. So that, besides the other shortage, is, is a big issue. How many flight schools does India have? Uh, apparently, there are eight or ten flight schools, out of which um, I would say five are, are really functional and uh, up to the uh, professionally run. Uh, there's a big challenge uh, to, ma to run a flight school in India because of the uh, airport policies and uh, the royalties that they have to pay. So most of these uh, businesses uh, do not remain viable for long. Uh, most of the Indian uh, Pilots go to uh, countries like U.S. or um, or Australia and other other regions to do their training. Okay, and, let's uh, this is the biggest issue which we are going to face very soon is the manpower shortage, mm -hmm. the pilots and the engineers. Well, but also because you know it's hard to think of a domestic aircraft apart from maybe China that's seen anything like the growth of India. Um, final question: There are 130 plus jets registered. Um, What's the percentage potential growth in our, the next three Our years? Bombardier nine-year forecast between 2018 to 2027, which is available online, predicts about 150 aircraft to be added in over the next nine-year period within South Asia. Majority of them are going to be India. Would you go for 150? Yeah, I would. I would go, uh, 150 to be added. Uh, now, yeah, I would say about 100. I think 150 is. Uh, so my, uh, our forecast is uh, South Asia, so it's not specific to just India, but that's what our 20-year forecast is. This is a problem. Nilesh was relying on you buying those 50. Uh, <laughs> uh, my view is um, I see another 30 or 40 aircrafts being added in, in the next five years. Okay. So nine year, when will India really become the market it should be? Just a date, just a year. I don't need the month. I think 2025, <laughs> that's when it'll really fly. I think 2020, it'll start taking off. Uh, and 2025 is when I think it'll be at cruising. I, I guess it all depends on the political situation. If Mr. Modi wins a second term, then things will start moving a little faster. And yes, by 2022 or 25, we should be fully up and running, hopefully. <laughs> I like, instead of giving a date, I just kind of would like to say that the sooner we can get DGCA to understand what business aviation is about, the sooner we can get some of the industry players um, and the customers to understand about benefits of third-party operators, um, and the sooner we can try to streamline and find a structure to work around the, uh, the tax um, <laughs> that is there, um, I think we can uh, increase. The demand is there. The demand is waiting in the wings to actually buy. Yeah, I think that much I will agree with you for sure. There is sufficient demand. Uh, I think demand is not the problem. The problem is just getting to provide the necessary you know, aircraft for that. Got one last question from David Best. If infrastructure is a key hurdle, does India have the structure to allow long-term ownership? Yes. Of infrastructure assets. Yes. If you look at Mumbai and Delhi and Bangalore and Hyderabad airports, I don't know if anybody, any of you guys remember, 2005, when I first started going there, there used to be one luggage belt in Mumbai airport, right? Now it's one of the best airport terminals in the world. It's all through public-private partnerships. So if you look at the infrastructure change in the airport in, in, in terms of commercial aviation, it's been phenomenal. I think there's an opportunity there from a business aircraft perspective. It's just, I think uh, the money is tied, tied up elsewhere, right? People have other priorities with the funds. As I said before, since commercial aviation is growing in India, we see that we will piggyback on that. And as the infrastructure go, grows for commercial aviation, uh, we see that business aviation will be sort of taken care of as well. <laughs> 
I agree. Uh, there have been both. I've seen the both sides of the coin. Um, at, uh, before the airports got privatized, uh, I, as an operator, experienced much easier way of uh, doing business and more conducive environment. Especially these private part public-private partnership airports have become more of a concern to business aviation rather than it has helped in growing. Um, you can see the, um, the constraint of uh, parking space in Mumbai. Uh, Mumbai is a place where we have customers who want to buy airplanes, at least seven, eight of them, which I know of, which can be, you know, if, if today we open up the parking, you will see seven, eight new more aircrafts coming into Mumbai. But uh, with the policy of Mumbai and Delhi, especially Mumbai Airport, which is not allowing any new parking stands for private jets, uh, that is restricting the growth. Even the hangar operators there are struggling to survive with the increased hangar rentals rates and things like that. But there are smaller airports, which are secondary airports, which actually do exist, but somehow haven't been activated. For instance, in Mumbai, you have an airport called Nasik, which is 20 minutes away. And uh, it has the full runway length. It has everything there. Uh, if that can be activated, then you can start having options uh, in, in all these cities as well. Then so, that will get activated with the commercial thing. When the regional connectivity starts, they'll activate that. So it's positive. You've just got to wait nine years. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Elsa. Thank you. Thanks, Al.